All right, thank you everyone for joining me today. I'm really excited to talk about how we can support clients who are experiencing mental health difficulties. Um, I am more so wearing my mental health provider hat today than my kinesiology hat today, um, largely because I know that everyone here is an exercise professional and I don't need to sell you on how amazing exercise is. Uh, what we're gonna talk about though is how we can support people who are experiencing mental health difficulties in various forms. Um, I don't have any conflicts of interest to declare. However, I do have lots of acknowledgements um, primarily to the Michael Smith Health Research VC, which is funding my postdoctoral fellowship and is letting me do talks like this. It's, it's, they're an amazing funding organization. So 10 tips for supporting mental health and after submitting this title to Nicole and the team here, I had this moment of, oh no, 10 tips, 50 minute talk. We are going to have to rock it. So we are going to dive straight into this. And I'm going to start with a bonus tip, which is actually we're gonna be doing 11 tips on mental health. I don't think I'm going to have to sell many people on this point because you're here today, we're talking about mental health, but just in case, we're gonna start with this. This is a wellness wheel. And you've probably seen this at some point in your training. It's become quite popular for how we understand wellness and health. And this idea that health isn't just the absence of illness, but this holistic state that encompasses many, many different parts of our life. What a wellness wheel looks like really differs between individuals. This is a general template. But you'll notice right away that in this general template, two of the categories that they have up there have to do with mental health. We have our intellectual wellness, um, which is really about our minds, our ideas, our ability to be curious, to make good decisions. And then we also have our emotional wellness, which really comes down to whether or not we can cope with challenges of day-to-day -day life. So two of these areas in most people's wellness wheels do relate to mental health. It's a big chunk of health, well-being, and the way we experience life. It's not just this though. Our mental health interacts with all other domains. Study after study after study has shown that our mental health impacts our financial well-being, our physical well-being, our spiritual well-being, how we connect with the environment, how we connect with other people. And it also has a big, big role in cancer care. Very, very simplified model, but mental health has intimate connections to exercise. Exercise has intimate connections with mental health and mental health and cancer interact on many, many different levels uh, before, during, and after the di cancer diagnosis. So it's an important thing to keep in mind whenever you're working with a patient or a client. So tip number one is it's a norm. So I want you to take a second and think about what comes to mind when I say mental health difficulty, mental illness, psychiatric disorder, that image, that initial word, that picture, that impression that you get. Now it might be something like mental health hospitals, asylums, particularly that historic sense, which so many of our horror movies are wonderfully awful at capturing. You might be thinking of something like serial killers. Or maybe your image of mental health, mental health difficulties is that rather eccentric neighbor, relative, aunt that you don't really talk to very often that you just know is just maybe a little bit off. These are all really common images that people have in their minds. I wanna start by challenging that though. And we're going to challenge it with this statistic. By about age 40, X percent of Canadians will have experienced mental illness, either historically have experienced or are currently experiencing. And is that 10, 20, 30, 40, or 50 percent of Canadians? Hold that number in your mind. The answer is 50 percent. So one in two Canadians by age 40 will have experienced mental illness. Within a given year, the statistic is one in five. So while these instances of mental illness do exist, these are very, very rare and very much the exception to the rule. What mental illness and mental health difficulties look like in real life 
is this. It might be this guy right here, or maybe this lady, or maybe one of these people, or maybe all of those people. It's something that happens in our communities to the people around us. It might be you, it might be your friends. Mental illness is something that happens to people, and it's something that happens in the community. It's also something that happens in cancer patients. Um, the numbers vary across different studies, but rough estimates is that about 20% increased risk of suicide, anxiety, perhaps up to 50% of patients, depression up to about 42% of patients, which is much, much higher than population averages. So we should go into interactions with patients not thinking that mental health difficulties are something abnormal or something unusual, but something that the person in front of us is probably experiencing. It's the norm. Our second tip is to know what it is. So what is this mental health difficulty, mental health that I'm talking about? Well, first off, it's not a thing as a collection of things. Mental health, mental health difficulties, psychiatric illness, whichever term you prefer, is an umbrella term. It includes many, many different types of diagnoses and difficulties, ranging from learning disabilities, um, autism, selective mutism, depression, schizophrenia, autism, or um, anxiety, sexual dysfunctions, sleep difficulties, feeding and eating disorders. It's a huge variety. I have a book sitting right over there, which is about 500 pages long. So it comes in many, many shapes and forms. And because of that, a person who's presenting with mental health difficulties could look very different than another person. Now, if you want to go back to that umbrella term, the American Psychiatric Association defines mental illnesses as health conditions involving changes in emotion, thinking, or behavior, three potential components. And these changes result in distress or problems functioning in day-to-day -day life. The key here, of course, is that these are health conditions. This isn't something that people are just putting on for show. This is, this is a medical diagnosis that people are experiencing. Now, the way medical diagnoses work is that we either give a diagnosis or we don't give a diagnosis, and we tend to think of mental health difficulties as occurring or not occurring. But people have rightly pointed out that these exist on a continuum. So while we in the diagnostic world are drawing lines and saying, okay, you meet diagnostic criteria or you don't meet diagnostic criteria, there's a whole range of presentations that people can experience in terms of symptom severity. Now, one of the challenges of this model right here, which has been rightly pointed out, is that mental illness is a very illness-focused model. So we assume that a person is either doing really, really well over here on this green end of thing, they're high quality of life, symptom-free, or we see, assume that they're in crisis and experiencing really, really severe symptoms. And this illness model doesn't actually do justice to the complexity of human experience. So what we have instead is organizations like patient advocacy groups and the World Health Organization presenting this alternative definition to mental illness, which is mental health. And mental health is this concept of positive well-being, where people can realize their activities, they can cope with stresses, they can be productive, they can be engaged with their family and their community. It's this very holistic, positive psychology well-being structure. And we can overlay these two together into an access model where mental illness can exist along one axis and mental health, health can exist along the other axis. Now, what this means is that someone could have mental illness, but be living a pretty good life. So I could have ADHD or I could have a learning disability or I could have depression. And yet my quality of life could be really good. I could be thriving in many, many other ways. On the flip side, I might not have symptoms that would mean that I have a diagnosis, and yet my quality of life can still be pretty poor. If you can think back to maybe your student days when you have that paper coming up and it's due the next day and you're really, really stressed and you haven't eaten and you haven't slept and you just feel like, whoa, this is really, really not good. That's probably what you're experiencing probably not experiencing symptoms, but your mental health, that quality, holistic, 
positive psychology, probably not doing that great. Now, as exercise providers, the cool thing is, is that exercise does both. Exercise can reduce the symptoms of mental illness, and exercise can also promote mental health. So we have a pretty cool tool in our tool belt where we can address both with our patients. Tip number three is check your stigma. Now, I'm going to give credit to this exercise to Dr. Lieberman, um, who has a wonderful YouTube video I'd highly recommend checking out. And that's so brilliant, I thought I'd bring it here. So imagine you've been invited to give a toast at a close friend's 50th birthday party. Big event, close friend, something you're really excited about and you're really honored to do. But on the day of the event, you fall sick. Now, would you rather say, I threw out my back or I'm having a panic attack? Would you rather say I have a kidney stone or I'm depressed and suicidal. Now I work in mental health and I know what I would like to say. And I suspect that's probably what you want to say as well. Throw out my back or I have a kidney stone. And this, if you're like me, and if those are the ones that you're choosing, it's a sign that you might have a stigma against mental health. Now, unfortunately, stigma against mental health is a reality in our culture. And it's something that has persisted and continues to persist despite all efforts. And I wish I could stand up here and say stigma doesn't exist. We're making really good progress on it. And we are slowly, but not fast enough. And stigma continues to be a major barrier for seeking care and discussing mental health with other people. Given this reality, it's really what we do with stigma that matters. We're not going to eliminate it overnight. I wish I could snap my fingers and it would be gone, but it's, it's not going to happen. What it takes is work on behalf of people like us, and particularly if we're going interaction, into interactions where we might be working with people who experience mental health difficulties, or as we talk to the people around us, we don't want to be spreading stigma. There's many, many different strategies to combat stigma, but three of the ones that we can do immediately right here right now is start to become aware of our own biases and stereotypes. We need to catch what our stigma is and become aware of them so that we don't perpetuate this, we don't spread this, and we don't act upon it in discriminatory ways towards people. We want to educate ourselves on the facts. So if you feel like mental health, mental illness is an area in your repertoire of knowledge that isn't well developed, Develop it. There's amazing resources. There's amazing readings. Nicole spoke about our CSET module, but there's so much online and available through public forums right now to, to learn about mental health difficulties. And then the third part, which is so important, is treating people with dignity and respect. Everyone, regardless of their mental health status, should be treated with dignity and respect. And going into interactions, treating people as human beings is such an important part of combating stigma. Tip number four is to be recovery focused. Now, a lot of us got into this line of work probably because we love exercise and also because we want to share that love with other people in the hopes of encouraging people to live a good life. We know that exercise improves well-being. We know that exercise improves health. We know that exercise can contribute to really positive relationships, which is amazing. Now in the cancer world, you're also probably aware that you can live a good life with cancer. So just because you have a cancer diagnosis, which is extremely challenging, doesn't mean that you don't have a good life. You can still have meaningful relationships and good connections, engage in hobbies and events and activities and occupation that are valuable to you and bring meaning and joy to yourself and people around you. And we see that every day in the lives of cancer people or cancer patients, people who are living with cancer. The same can be true of mental health. You can live a good life with mental health difficulties. The two are not mutually exclusive. And this is the principle of recovery focused practice is encouraging people and supporting people in the quest to live a good life, whatever that good life looks like for them. And the Mental Health Commission of Canada has an amazing resource that outlines this. Um, this is a very, very quick summary of four of their main points. 
the first of which is to create a culture and language of hope. And this means that we work with people in you know, sometimes difficult situations, but what we want to do is inspire hope, realistic hope, but hope. We want to remain positive. We want to say that recovery is possible. It is possible to live a good life. And in particular, we want to work with the person's strengths. And going into our interactions with our patients and having the assumption that this person does have inherent strengths that we can utilize and build upon is such a powerful, powerful approach to approaching care, where we bring this person and their abilities into the center of our interactions. And that's what we build upon. Their second point is that recovery is personal. And recovery looks different for every single person. For some people, that might be living a completely symptom-free life. For other people, it could be managing their symptoms with regular therapy, medication, and medical appointments. It really depends on the person. We can also carry this through to the world of exercise and how we work with people in exercise contexts. For some people, that exercise environment and regular exercise looks like five gym activities, heavy workouts per week. Whereas for other people, living this active lifestyle looks like going for a walk with their spouse once a week. So we need to tailor our expectations and our programming to what the person wants and what the person sees as being central to their recovery. Their third point is that recovery occurs in the context of one's life, which means that it's not the hospital where recovery occurs. There's not the doctor's office. It's not the cancer clinic. It's within the community. So it's in a person's homes. It's with their friends. It's with their family. It's on the seawall walking trail where people actually recover and reap the benefits of recovery. So to the greatest extent possible, we want to encourage people to engage in these amazing community-based, family-based interactions. In the exercise environment, that could be linking people up to community resources like recreation teams, sports clubs, um, intramural groups. We want them to exercise with their family members, with their children, with their spouse, with their brothers and sisters. And we want them to take their exercise out of the clinical setting and into the communities in which they live. And then their last really big tip is to respond to diverse needs and understand that everyone is walking into our gyms, our hospitals, our clinics with a unique profile. And sometimes those needs are quite obvious. Sometimes they might require a little bit more digging on our behalf but we want to be aware of this variation between individuals and adapt and adjust our service to what their needs are to the extent that we can. Tip number five is it's not what you do, but it's how you do it. Now, this tip comes from the world of therapy and psychology and for some people, this, this area of work is a bit of a mystery where there's a little bit of magic that happens and people go into the clinic and they come out and they're suddenly better. It's, it's actually a bit more complicated than that. I wish I had a magic wand in those days. What typically happens in therapy is that you have a therapist and you have a patient and they're working together. And there's been a number of studies that have been conducted looking at what behavioral or cognitive or emotion focused approaches, treatments or strategies work best for specific presenting problems. And we tailor what we deliver to a patient based upon their presenting need. So if someone comes in with anxiety, I'm going to do a different treatment than if someone comes in with a post-traumatic disorder. The skills that I pull out of my toolbox are going to be different. And for a long time, we thought that these skills that we're applying in different situations are what matters most to therapy outcomes. And then, some studies came out starting from the 1990s, looking at what is the most active component of therapy. So what do we do that matters most? If it's an anxiety treatment, is it gonna be the exposure? If it's a depression treatment, is it going to be the cognitive work? And what kind of surprised, but what didn't really surprise everyone is that those factors actually don't matter very much. I mean, sure, yeah, like if someone's coming in with anxiety, it's not gonna be appropriate to pull out a treatment that we might use for someone with psychosis. Like you have to make sure it fits, just like a good pair of shoes. 
But at the end of the day, it's not really the specific strategy that matters, but it's how you're delivering it. It's the relationship between two people that matters absolutely the most. So this comes back to the idea of the therapeutic alliance or the working alliance. And this refers to the relationship between a care provider and their patient, which is just a fancy way of saying, you know, how do you connect, behave, and interact with each other? What is this relationship like? And a good relationship, if I'm sitting in a therapy room with someone, a good relationship, that connection that I form with the patient in front of me, could in and of itself be responsible for up to 70, like seven zero percent of therapeutic outcomes. It's really, really important to have a good relationship. Now, this is not to say that you can go and provide unethical care. As an exercise provider, don't go into a non-evidence-based technique. Don't push the person beyond their limits. Don't do things that are unsafe. That's, that's not an excuse saying like, well, I have a good relationship so I can go and do this not quite so ethical practice. What it does say is that you, know, you need to deliver good quality, ethical, safe care. But that care is gonna make a bigger impact if you have a good relationship. And really what it comes down is to is trust. So if you're in a relationship where the person trusts you, where they feel like they can be heard, where they feel like they're valued, they're gonna go into these interactions that you have with them in a completely different mindset. They're going to have faith in what you're saying. They're going to be open and vulnerable with you. They're gonna talk about the difficulties that they're having in their exercise program. They're gonna be willing to just share with you, you know, why didn't they do their home practice this week? And when you ask them to try new, maybe scary things, maybe you know, going up that weight or maybe trying a new exercise or maybe going out for a run on the sidewalk instead of on the treadmill, they're gonna be more likely to say, okay, I'll give it a go because that fundamental trust is there. So how do we build this relationship is the big question. If this relationship is so important to how we support clients and how do we get clients moving to where we want them to be, how do we build it? What's the foundation? And the first step is to harden back to the title, actually listen. We need to engage in active listening with our clients and with our patients right from the get-go. So once again, a little bit of test for yourself. Over the past, we've been here for about 26 minutes. Have you been checking your social media? I have done online training since Zoom has become a thing. And I tell you, I've never been quite so up to date with my Instagram than during a training video. It's a great time to become updated. Have you, if you're in your home or maybe through text or telephone, been talking with your friends and family? I know it's a little bit later in mountain time. Have you been cooking dinner, having a snack? Are you currently in your car commuting? In which case, this video will be available and recorded later. Please don't drive distracted. Or have you just been daydreaming? Have you been drifting off a little bit? We are not very good at active listening. And I will say this as someone who's trained for the past seven-ish years in how to active listen to people. It is really hard work to active listen. Our brains like to stay busy. Our brains like to have ideas. And to stay with the person in the moment, to discard everything else that's going on inside of us, in our heads, and outside of us can be a big, big challenge. And it's not something that just happens overnight. It does take practice and dedication to develop. Even when we're in an interaction with someone and we're giving it our all, we get passionately invested in a conversation, we might also not be actively listening because you might've noticed people like to talk about themselves and we like to tell our own stories. And we do this as part of a way to relate to other people. But if that person in front of you is telling you their story and then you start to interrupt with your own story, 
oh my gosh, I totally know what you're saying. Last week when I was at the grocery store, you should have seen this guy. That's not active listening. That's embedding ourselves into the person's story. So we need to learn how to take a step back and immerse ourselves in what the person is saying. And again, I'll echo this idea that this process of genuine listening is really, really difficult. We have to stretch our muscles and practice it. Now, the good thing is, is that it's relatively easy to active listening. Let's take practice, but it's not like you have to go through a clinical psychology program to be a good active listener. Our very first step in active listening is to attend to the person. So that means we put down our cell phones. Now that's hard for some people. I had a trainer once who I worked with who loved checking his like media when I was on the treadmill, but put that cell phone away. We want to orient our body towards the person. We want to face the person as we're listening. We want to make sure that we're maintaining eye contact, not in the creepy up staring at you way, but a natural eye contact where we're listening. Leaning into the person can be really helpful. And then making nonverbal responses to show that we're listening. So the famous therapist sound of mm -hmm, nodding our heads, showing that, yeah, yeah, I am tuned into you right here and right now. The second part of active listening, once we have the information in our ears and into our brains, is actually understanding what the person is saying. So as you might know, not all communication is verbal. It's not everything, not everything that I say is actually what I say. So paying attention to what the person is saying, the actual words that are coming out of their mouth, but as well as the tone of voice that they're communicating it with. I love push-ups is different than I love push-ups. Two very, very different sentiments. And we want to tap into that. We want to pay attention to their body language. We want to pay attention to the emotions that they're communicating as they're communicating with us. And once we have an idea of what they're saying, once we actually understand what their experience is, we want to respond. And we want to respond in a thoughtful way that shows that we're listening. Again, that's not embedding ourselves into the conversations. It's reflecting back that, yes, I do hear you. I get what you're saying. And sometimes our responses can be literally saying that. It can be saying things like, yeah, I get that. I understand. It can be an empathetic statement where we're saying, I understand the approach that you're coming from. Yeah, that kind of sucks. We can offer a reflection, which is literally when we're telling the person what they just said to us, often paraphrasing it. So they understand that, yeah, it's come in, it's computed, we're understanding it. So if a person starts to talk about how they didn't do their homework this past week, they didn't go for their walks because their husband was sick and their kids were having a hard time at school and their boss yelled at them. We might reflect this by saying something like, sounds like you've had a really busy week. You must have been feeling really overwhelmed. To let them know that we're hearing them. Responses don't have to be formulaic. They can be really, really genuine and they can be really earnest. You're allowed to be a person in these interactions. It's really important. What we need to communicate to the person though is that they have been. Tip number seven is follow the golden rule. And to probably date myself a little bit, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Especially don't be an asshole if we want to be a little bit more crude. So there's a lot of things that people look for in interactions. And you can imagine yourself heading into the setting, you've recently been diagnosed with cancer. Your doctor has said that they want you to go into a gym and see this exercise physiologist. Exercise physiologist, is this? I don't know what they're talking about. I think it's an exercise physiologist. You haven't exercised in years. You're out of shape and you're terrified because you have cancer. And what are you gonna be looking for in that interaction? You probably don't want someone who's gonna come across with the personality of a brick. You probably don't want someone who's going to be completely cool and dismissive. You probably don't want someone who is going to not listen to you. What you're looking for in someone in that inter what you're looking for in that interaction is someone who is going to be warm, is going to be kind, and is going to get you. 
and who isn't going to judge you. And in particular in therapy settings, really what clients tend to look for is someone who's genuine, someone who's empathetic, and someone who's non-judgmental. All of these things can contribute to each and every one of our interactions with our patients and clients from that initial phone call or email that we send to our final interaction with them. We really want to come across as warm. If we're coming across as cool, aloof, dismissive, people are going to read into that and understand it pretty quickly and get that you just aren't interested in them. And if they're going to come and give it their all and you just aren't interested, they're going to back away pretty darn fast. But genuineness is reflecting on you as a person. So within our interactions to people, we don't need to be robots. We don't need to be perfect clinicians. We need to be people because people are looking to connect with other people. If it was as simple as, you know, getting some instructions and going to do it, we'd have robots telling us what to do long before now. We really want those human connections in most of our clinical interactions. So when you are working with a patient and responding to a patient, it's okay to let your personality show. If you have a rather sarcastic sense of humor, as long as it's not profession or unprofessional and offensive, you, know, you can let that shine. If you're someone who tends to be warm, definitely be naturally warm and to show that kindness. If you're someone who's having an emotional reaction to a person, and as long as it's not unprofessional and potentially damaging to the relationship, let them know that. Say, you know, I'm really proud of you. If you're feeling proud of the person, if you're really happy for them, say that you're happy. If they disclose something that makes you sad, you can tell them that you're sad. It's okay to have these genuine human interactions. Right with that comes empathy. And empathy isn't feeling sorry for people. It's not pitying people. It's getting where people come from. It's putting yourself in that person's shoes and understanding what they're living and what they're experiencing and what emotions are going on. Empathy is saying, you know, I feel it as well. And sometimes that can be a bit harder for us if there's a lot of differences between ourselves and the person. Um, if that person's experiencing something that we've never experienced ourselves. But, you know, we have these great brains of ours and we're able to imagine perhaps and say, you know, I think I know what you feel. Or we can also ask the person and say, you know, I'm trying to understand this. Can you please describe it to me a bit more to help us empathize with the person? A big characteristic is being non-judgmental. We are, as a species, we tend to be super, super judgy. And we are judgy towards ourselves. And we are judgy towards other people. And the last thing a person needs in an exercise setting is being judged. People are already coming in and they're being, feeling self-conscious and vulnerable. And they don't need their trainer judging them for not being able to do a push-up or for not doing their home practice assignment. So we want to accept people where they are and where they're at. We will always want to encourage them to do better, of course. You know, this is you know, part of our job as exercise professionals is to help people grow and develop. But we want to do so in this way that's supportive and nurturing rather than judgy judgy. Along with that comes, of course, encouragement. We, we do want to encourage people. We want to inspire hope in people, not just let them down constantly. We want them to leave on a slightly more positive note than when they came in. And part of this is setting positive expectations, expectations for recovery, expectations for wellness, expectations for connecting with the community. The important thing, of course, is that these expectations, expectations have to be realistic. You know, probably not wise to promise someone that they're going to become like the Usain Bolt of sprinters. We know that's probably not going to happen. But we can accept, you know, a realistic expectation is that if people exercise regularly, they too tend to feel better. They tend to condition, their physical health tends to improve. We know from the cancer literature that people tend to do better with their outcomes. So setting those positive expectations can be really powerful. We want to be competent, of course. So we need to communicate confidence in our abilities, in our skills, in the programs that we deliver. And we need to educate people on this. You can put on your geeky hat and describe the amazing science that's been done talking about exercise and oncology and health outcomes. And showcase you know, the knowledge that you have and the skills that you have. Of course, competence needs to be specific. So if you are not a pro in an area, also acknowledge that. 
and say, this isn't my area of expertise, but I know who to connect you with to talk about these things, or I'm willing to go and do some research in order to learn more about this. It's a great example of confidence of knowing what you don't know. And also a bit of genuineness when you're saying, you know, hey, I'm not able to do everything, but I'm willing to try. And our last part is being responsive to people. You know, responsiveness in the moment. So we want to be there for the person when they're having good times and having bad times. And also responsiveness in when we receive feedback. We'll talk about feedback. I think it's the next, I think it's the next one. Ah, no, number nine is feedback, spoiler. Number eight is having common goals. You probably talk about goals all the time with your clients because they're really, 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 really important. They are a direction. They help us structure things and know where we're going. You might not talk about values quite so often though, but values are really important to bring into our sessions. If you wanna get very technical, a goal is the object of ambition. It's, it's where we want to go, it's our finish line. But a value has more to do with our principles and our standards and our judgment of what's important in life. So an example of a value could be family. A goal around family could be, I want to get married. So the two are related to each other, but a goal has a clear finish line, marriage, whereas a value is not something that we can ever achieve. A value is something that's aspirational that we continuously work towards. Or we might wanna think of a value as a compass direction. So a value could be heading east or heading west, whereas the goals are the mile markers along the way. We're never going to get east. I mean, we just keep on going around the world in circles and circles, but we can achieve them lots of miles in between. Now, values and goals shape treatment and they shape what we do in our day-to-day -day life as well. People tend to do better when they're living and behaving in ways that are value congruent. So if I'm acting in ways that support my value of family, or if I'm acting in ways that support my value of integrity, or if I act in ways that are supporting my value of environments, I tend to do better in terms of my well-being and mental health. And you can imagine how these could come into the exercise setting. So if I value my relationships with people, I might prefer an exercise settings where I'm able to connect with other people. If I place really good value or really strong value on my physical health outcomes, I might want an exercise program that's really going to emphasize the physical conditioning. Now, if your client comes in with a value, I want to be social. I want to connect with other people because relationships are what matters to me most. But your value is, hey, I want to make sure that this person can go through chemotherapy standing on their feet. Those aren't necessarily compatible values. And you and your patient, you and your client are going to diverge in your path and you're going to have a different language and a different approach. And this can lead to tension in your relationship with them. So very, very early on in the process of whenever we work with people, we want to clarify what their values and what their goals are and understand why they hold this. So why are social relationships important to you? Why is family important to you? Why is physical health important to you? Because this is going to guide almost every aspect of how we approach and work with the person and also the exercise program that we develop for. This consensus on what you're doing and why is so, so important because if the client or patient knows what you're doing, they're gonna buy into your program, especially if it matches with their values. So if a person knows that you're putting them in this group-based program because it's a really good social environment, they're gonna buy into it a little bit more. If a person's concerned about physical intimacy with their partner, we know that cardiovascular system is super important with that. If you explain to them how the aerobic exercise that you're prescribing them could improve their physical intimacy, chances are they might buy in to your treadmill program more strongly than if you just say, go run on the treadmill. So having common goals really does impact motivation. It also lays some common ground in terms of expectations for the program. 
if a person comes into the program and they want that social experience, and that's what they're wanting, at the end of the program, it means that they're probably going to have their needs and their wants and their values satisfied. They're going to have their expectations met. Versus if they come in with different expectations than what you offer them, they're not going to be satisfied. They're going to be disgruntled. They might drop out of the program early on. And these common goals also provide a common metric for measuring progress. So as you work with this person, it provides this marker for how do we track progress and how do we track if we're moving along the right direction. So what happens if one of our patients has a goal that's different than ourselves? That happens. It happens a lot, actually. So we come in and we think, hey, we're going to like physically condition this person. They're going to be like a little athlete or a really cool athlete, maybe not little. And this person comes in and they're wanting that social experience. That's where we need to have a discussion with them. And fundamentally, really what we want to resort to is patient-centered care, where just because we have an idea of what we think is necessary for the client, if that doesn't line up with the client wants, we really should default to the client's preferences and choices. The exception to this is immediate concerns around safety. So if our client wants to go and do an exercise or an intensity that we know is unsafe for them, of course, giving ethical, responsible, safe care, we need to redirect them, but we need to do so in a respectful way where we explain to them why this might not work. It's all about this process of communication with them and making sure we're on even ground. So number nine is, as I alluded to, feedback. Feedback's really important when we're setting goals. Um, the way a typical goal works, highly simplified, is that we set a goal, we develop a plan, we enact a plan, we check in and we say, hey, have I reached my goal yet? If we achieve our goal, we exit, we say, great, I've reached my goal, all is good. If we haven't reached our goal, we typically go back, revise our plan, reassess, and we give it another shot. And we keep on trying again and again and again until we reach our goal or we decide, hey, I'm checking out. So feedback, of course, plays a really, really important part right here with this evaluate. Evaluate is receiving feedback on what is our progress like so far and are we doing good or do we need to go back and do revisions? You as an exercise professional working with these clients though can give feedback in so many other places. Right from the start of our interactions where we're setting goals with each other to our very end, when that person is leaving our program and we're congratulating them and celebrating their progress, we can provide feedback the entire way. And providing feedback to people, not just statistics about how their physical progress is going, but also talking about the nature of the relationship, their effort, the hard work that they've been doing, can both motivate them in terms of that positive encouragement and also tell them in, again, a gentle, compassionate, patient-centered way where they might be falling short or where they might need to adjust. So for instance, if the person is part of their exercise program and they just aren't sticking to the exercise sessions, they're regularly no-showing, they aren't doing their home practice, we can provide them feedback, again, in a gentle, patient-centered, respectful way about you know, how important it is to come to sessions regularly to do their home practice. And if they don't, this is potentially one of the consequences. We want to be that objective board that can give people feedback as to what's going on. The other side of feedback, of course, is that we want to receive feedback from our clients. Sometimes we do this right at the end of the service. So as people are exiting, we have their feedback on their satisfaction forms. They head off into the wild, we get a report every couple months saying, you know, people have said this about you. What we want to do instead is normalize the feedback process and receive feedback throughout the entire process of working with someone right from the start. Some of these tools um, that we use in therapy is the session waiting scale, where at the end of every single time we work with someone, we give them this really, really quick four item scale, which asks about how's the relationship going? How are we doing with our goals? Is this approach working for me? And overall, what do I think? It's a really, I might say, a quick and dirty way of getting a sense of how sessions are going and to get the immediate feedback as to what we can do differently. 
This, of course, involves printing out some paper. So a much, much easier way is to simply have conversations with people. Maybe during the cool down session when the person's on the mat stretching out, you can have these conversations really easily. And one of my favorite ways to do it is just this final point right here is, how did it go today for you? Is there something I can do differently next time to help you? This can be really, really hard for our patients and clients because there's an intimate or there's a, there's a quite persistent power differential between the provider and the patient. But normalizing the process, really encouraging them, ensuring that they feel heard and giving them opportunities is something that we can do to help even out this power differential and ensure that we're tailoring services to what the person needs. Now, the catch of this, of course, is that we have to respond. It's one thing to receive feedback. And if we keep on asking for feedback and asking for feedback and asking for feedback, and we never do anything about it, the person's not going to give us feedback anymore. So if that changes within the realm of things that we can control, we need to do our very, very best to do it. So if a person wants to do exercise A instead of B during their warm up, that's within our control. We can't probably change the lighting in the gym space. We can, however, provide feedback and say, hey, I'm sorry, I don't have much control over this. Let me pass it on to the people above me to let them know. Our final tip is know your limits. Uh, is it in Alberta, know your limits, play within it? This is, this is not about lotteries though. So a friendly reminder that exercise professionals are experts in exercise. And it is such an amazing skill set. It's one that not many people have. Good, high quality exercise programming is such an important skill set that you guys have been trained in. Being experts in exercise, we're not expecting you to be experts in mental health. So while we can use these tips, while we can educate ourselves on mental health care, how to be a responsible provider who really promotes psychological safety, Nobody's expecting you to be a therapist or a counselor or a psychologist. So if you come across a patient or a client who you think needs help, and if you're worried in particular about imminent risks, that's risk of self-harm or suicide or harming another person or harm to a child or vulnerable adults, there's resources available. The 833 number up on the screen is for the Canadian Suicide Prevention Line. You can call it 24 seven, night or day. You do not have to be in crisis. You could just be worried about someone and they can help consult. 911 or emergency, is all, emergency room is always an option or calling social services if there's a child or vulnerable adult. If it's not a crisis, there's lots of supports in our community for ourselves if we need support and also for our patients. Um, many cancer centers do have mental health services. Family doctors are a great network. Um, I'd also say that peer support networks are amazing. Just having that trusted network of peers around us that we can turn to for help. And you know, lastly, we really need to take care of our own mental health hygiene too. Working with patients, especially patients who experience chronic conditions can really, really impact us as providers. Uh, you know, we hear of really happy stories, but we also hear really sad stories that we can carry with us. So making sure that we're taking care of our own mental health, watching our own diet, watching our own exercise, sleeping well, having good social relationships and setting healthy boundaries, especially with work, can be things that we can do to protect ourselves and to make sure that we're able to go into these interactions with patients in that warm, genuine, empathetic, really enthusiastic way that we want to bring to them. my oh, Jeff. <laughs> 10 tips, 53 minutes. I think that was pretty good. I was, I was worried we'd go well over. I think that's everything. Um, I'm really excited if there's questions or feedback um, to hear what people think. Please feel free to unmute. I think we have some questions in the chat going.